Ladies and gentlemen, a very, very good afternoon. I'm going to ask you to please take your seats as, uh, as we begin this inaugural LDE Talks, which is going to be phenomenal. So I thank every single one of you for being with us this afternoon. I promise you this is going to be one of those sessions that we hope you will never forget and we hope becomes a regular feature at the LDE conferences from now onwards. So again, let me introduce myself. My name is Leanne Manas. I am from South Africa and we have come with a very, very big delegation from South Africa to be here and address you at LDE. And it is possibly one of the greatest things I think that us as a group of South Africans have had to experience to come here, to come almost full circle. But I'll talk to you a little bit more. I just want to talk to you about how LDE Talks is going to work. So, first and foremost, we have got some of the most esteemed speakers from all over the world that have gathered here with us today. Each one of them are going to be given seven minutes, only seven minutes, to talk to us. They're going to talk to us about their heritage, about their roots, about where they come from, who they are, and what they have done. The one thing in common, every single one of us have Lebanese roots. And that, my dear friends, is what makes us special. Nothing else. It doesn't matter what we've achieved. It's what's flowing through our blood, I think, that has led us to where we are today. So that's the one commonality between all of us. Otherwise, we are all so different. Every single one of us come from different places in the world and are all brought into this beautiful dome that has been erected for us today. So without further ado, I'm going to start the clicker and I'm going to start talking to you because I've got the honor of being the very, very first speaker of this 2019 LDE Talks. So I'm going to ask the, uh, the guys to put up a photograph because I usually speak for about an hour. Uh, I do presentations at home all the time. But this time I know that I don't have much time. So I, I'm speaking from the heart. I've been trying to prepare something. And every time I sit down, nothing comes out. And I think it's, it's a good thing because I want my heart to do the speaking as opposed to my brain today. So I sent a photograph through, and I'm hoping that we can put it up on the screen, of a lady that may not mean anything to anyone. There you go. But she means everything to me. I only knew her for a few years. And if it wasn't for her, I wouldn't be me. If it wasn't for what she did, I wouldn't be here. I don't know how many years ago it was, but it was... I think it was in about uh, the, the early 1900s where this woman, she was pregnant, she had two young children, and she had lost her husband. She was desperate and wanted to find a life, a good life for her and her children. She left this beautiful country with two children and one inside of her, got onto a boat and went to a strange land to start a new life. They knew they had land in South Africa. Her mother-in-law was in South Africa, and she came here. She couldn't speak the language of South Africa. She knew nothing about the culture. She had never walked the streets of South Africa. She was a stranger in a country that didn't necessarily want her, and she started a life. She started a life that gave opportunities to her children. Those opportunities were then given to their children, and their children, and their children, and here I am. My journey has come full circle, and today I know that this woman, Selma, is looking down on me, and I think she's looking down on me on disbelief, because I do not believe that she thought that the brave move of taking her fate into her own hands would allow me to do what I do, and allow me to have a voice to come back and speak to you to say, that as many diaspora, as many people that have left, South, uh, left Lebanon and gone somewhere else, we have never forgotten the roots. We've never forgotten who we are. And that is flowing through our blood, and that's what makes us so incredible. So as I say, this woman may not mean much, but if it wasn't for her and her strength and her determination to realize that there is better for people in this world, she took that brave move, and I think all of us can learn a lesson from her, and I certainly have. So to cut a very, very long story short, I was a young girl. My mother was born in South Africa. Her mother, however, that is, that is my great-grand, so that's my, my, um, my grand's mother. And 
she came here, and so I lived in South Africa my whole life. I don't speak the language. I was unfortunately never taught the language. But one thing I have inside of me is that libanity. You know that libanity that the minister was talking about yesterday? I, I'd never thought about it before as something that was inside of me, but the way he said it, it made all the sense in the world. Suddenly I've discovered where that fire of passion and determination and that feeling of nobody can tell me that I can't make it if I myself know I can make it. And that's what's so incredible about libanity. It's this resilience. The resilience of people that can tell you no, and yet you can go out and tell them, no, I don't believe you, I can make it happen. And that's what's so important. There's another woman that I met along the journey of my life that I would like to share a photograph with you. I had the privilege and honor of sitting down a few times and, and, and meeting and speaking to Oprah Winfrey during my career. And what I had always said was that I wanted to be like her. I wanted to mold Leanne Manus, who I was, around her. She said to me there and then, don't let anybody tell you who you must be. Even though you look at somebody and think that they are great, don't try to be like them, because there already is someone like that. Be yourself. Be Leanne Manus. That was one of the first few years of my life in my career. And that was when I realized that I do not have to be someone else. I do not have to prove or change to be someone that someone else wants to accept. If I can accept myself for who I am and for what I am, I think that other people can do that. And that, I think, has been a huge part of my journey. I work in a country where we have gone through so much. Many of you may not know what South Africa stands for or the difficult times that South Africa has been through. We were under an apartheid government system where if you were black, you were nothing. If you were white, you were everything. Um, blacks were not allowed to sit on the same chair as whites. Blacks were not allowed to drink from the same cups as a white person. Blacks were not allowed to vote in an election. They had no say in their country, and yet they were the majority of the population. There was another man, and I'll put this photograph up. In fact, this is the first word I heard when I arrived in Lebanon, and it was Nelson Mandela. You were talking about him in your news bulletin, and I couldn't believe it. If it wasn't for this man, South Africa wouldn't be the country that it is. And as much as the resilience that we talk to, that Lebanon has been through, I know that you've been through a civil war. South Africa was on the brink of a civil war, but we never went there. We never went there because this man knew how to forgive. He stayed in prison for 27 years to forgive. 27 years to forgive a white oppressor and come and join each other. The first thing I did when I arrived in Beirut yesterday was I asked our driver to take us to the Holiday Inn. He didn't know what I was talking about. He said to me, no, you're not staying at the Holiday Inn, you're staying at the Royal Tulip. I said to him, I know, but I want to know where I am. I want to feel where I am. Take me to the Holiday Inn. You know the Holiday Inn that is bombed out, that is full of bullet holes, that is a reminder of where this country has come from? I want you to take me there. And that's what he did. We went there, I jumped out of the car, and I went and I stood in front of this building. And I looked and I felt what it is that you as a country has been through and how far you have come. And I can feel the change. I can feel that this is the Lebanon that I've heard about, that I've been taught about, that I have inside of me. And to see what that building looks like and to see what I have seen and experienced now you guys have resilience that I've never, ever seen. And that's what makes South Africa and Lebanon so, so similar, is that our cultures come together with the Libanity and something that we call Ubuntu. It is togetherness, it is acceptance, it is forgiveness, it is about working together, and it is not about creating walls, it's about bashing down walls and allowing us to all be together as one. And I thank you for bashing this route down for all of us as expatriates to come back here and experience this. There's one thing, however, that I do need to say. And I work in the media, and I have been working in the media for very many years, is that I don't know this Lebanon. What I'm seeing here, I'm learning for the first time. We as the media are to blame for portraying countries in ways that are not true. The media want us to believe that 
Lebanon is still falling apart, that Lebanon is still the Holiday Inn. Lebanon is not that. Lebanon is anything but that. And we need to show the world that this has changed. You need to tell your stories. You need to speak more to the world about what this country has achieved in the short amount of years and that it is not going back there. And I can promise you one thing, that that is the message that I am going to take home to South Africa and tell everybody that this is an inspiration that is going to make me want to change everything and anyone that I meet. And I think that that is just something that is so fantastic. So ladies and gentlemen, I could speak forever because I want to speak forever, but I can't unfortunately. But the reality is, is that being here is a full circle for me. I said last night that the future, that, that home that my, my great-grandmother left and the road that she took have finally met. And they have met here where I'm standing right now. And this is the apex of our togetherness and that bashing down walls and creating something that is incredible. And I thank you very, very much for having us all here. So, So when I told you I was speaking from the heart, I wasn't joking. There was nothing academic about what I said here this, this, this afternoon. Everything came from my heart and I still feel so much more. However, you have a lot of magnificent speakers that are going to come up here as well and also talk to what they have achieved and what they are feeling right now. And I have no doubt that their hearts are going to be as filled with uh, passion as mine is. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm not going to give a very long introduction to everybody. We don't have time. I'm just going to tell you who they are and what they've done. And uh, they will come up and talk to you. Please put your hands together for our next speaker, His Excellency and the former um, Foreign Affairs Minister. This was, of course, uh, while he was in uh, Brazil. Please, Mr. Francisco Rezek, will you please come up and address us? Thank you so very much, Leanne. Uh, uh, I have uh, a very few things to say about myself. Uh, uh, I have uh, only uh, the pride of having been uh, the third man of pure Lebanese origin to reach the Supreme Court of Brazil and the first and unique to be the Secretary of State, to be the Chancellor of the country uh, many years ago. Uh, I come from a family uh, uh, which emigrated in uh, the early years of uh, the 20th century and they installed there in the mountains of Minas Gerais in the region of, uh, of the city of Sao Paulo also. And, uh, uh, what is now my major concern when I think of our Lebanity, when I think of our origins, is the fact that uh, I'm recalling now what has been said yesterday by President Michel Aoun when he stressed that uh, maybe we are lacking a, a sense of uh, unity, of union. As you all know, our vulnerability comes essentially from the fact that uh, so many times in our lives, in our histories, we have been divided. We become vulnerable to those who in the Western world and in some other parts of the world don't love us, we become vulnerable when they see that we are not closely united as we should be. Uh, in this moment in Brazil, we have a uh, a new president, uh, brilliantly elected, with a, a difference of voters over the second-ranked candidate, 
which is uh, numerically superior to the whole population of countries like Portugal or Sweden. But uh, this man, in spite of his uh, very good intentions in the economic area, in the social area, in the area of uh, public security, uh, seems to have uh, learned nothing, for instance, about the Middle East, about the history of this part of the world, about the special legal status of the city of Jerusalem. And uh, he has been saying uh, nonsense of all sorts about the problem. This is a, a serious uh, offense to most Brazilians, since we are in that country uh, not talking about those who have been all already called by God, who have emigrated uh, from Lebanon and who came to Brazil from the late 19th century. Uh, so speaking only about those who are now alive and uh, including not only the pure-blooded Lebanese, but also those who have 50%, 25%, over the half percent of Lebanese blood, and those who have been aggregated by our colony due to marriage. We reach easily more than 80 million people. It's impossible to abstract, to ignore the importance of that data. So what I really hope is that we, we uh, let's say, we should prepare the Lebanese community all over the world to show, to exhibit to the rest of the world our union, our common purposes having to do with the, the Lebanese tradition of tolerance, of, uh, of the feeling, for instance, that religion is something that, that exists to resolve problems, not to create problems. This is essentially Brazilian as a philosophy. Religion is supposed to resolve problems, not to create problems, and it's, it's unbearable to face problems nowadays. At this point of the history of mankind, problems created by religion. So, uh, we, 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 should be, we should try to be loyal to the purposes expressed yesterday by President Michel Aoun and favor as much of, as we can the unity of this country, uh, of all its uh, projects, that, has, that have been uh, stressed uh, uh, during the last uh, uh, 48 hours, uh, and we should uh, eventually try to preserve our union worldwide and to do what we can to show, to show proudly our identity and to do it fastly not uh, not to be not to not to delay in this purpose uh, a philosopher from south america said once uh, i have spent all my life searching for some answers and why when i eventually found those answers the questions had changed the questions were no longer the same so Let's not uh, permit that to occur to us. Let's update our questions, update our projects, update our dreams under the light of the center. Thank you very much. All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very, very much to our uh, speaker, Mr. Francisco Rezek. Now, our next speaker, 
cooked for us last night, and he, it was delicious. It was absolutely amazing. Thank you again for feeding us, as the Lebanese know how to best do that, through culinary, get to the heart of everyone around the world. But he's a Michelin star chef. I'm going to invite him up to address us. Please, ladies and gentlemen, give him a warm welcome, uh, Mr. Aline Jean, chef and owner of Michelin starred restaurant in Paris. Bonjour tout le monde. Uh, hello. Toujours c'est le même problème. Quelle langue on va parler au Liban? Français, arabe. Mi birf bedi yahki bel arabe yirfa edo. Okay. I'm very sorry for the guy who woman doesn't speak English. I hope somebody else can explain for you what I'm going to say in Arabic. So I'm going to add him here. Chef Alan Azam Jam, Aslim Trablos. وبي اصله من سير الضنيه ضيعة بالشمال وامي مترابلوس. أه انا من اللبنانيه اللي خلقانين بليبيريا بمنروفيا، تركنا ليبيريا مشان الحرب الاهليه كان عمري خمس سنين، للاسف الشديد جيت على لبنان كمان قر حرب اهليه، طفولتي كانت كثير كثير صعبه ما اخترتها انا يعني بس كان حربين بولوتي. كبرت مثل كل الشباب اللبناني مواليد ال 75 ما كان في شهادات عيامي رحت عملت خدمة عسكرية وكنت بالمطبخ من شعام المدرسة فندقية بس كان عندي الحظ عندي والدتي هي اللي علمتني حب الناس قبل ما أطبخ لهم علمتني الكرم مثل كل أمهاتنا بلبنان علمتني كيف استقبل الناس كيف اهتم فيهم والدي كان من الناس اللي كتير خسر كل اللي حققه بأفريا لما اجى على لبنان فتح محل سميني واخذني معه على سن العشر سنين، علمني عد واحد زائد واحد صار اثنين، بس يكون معك اثنين تصرف واحد بتخلي معك واحد. كبرت هون لسن 23 خدت فيزا رحت فيها على باريس سبعة ايام. صرت على باريس، أول لغة تعلمتها هي الإنجليزي، ثاني لغة اللي تعلمتها هي العربي، وفرنسي ما بحكي ولا كلمة، بعرف بونجور، أورفوار، ميرسي. ما بعرف حدا، وصلت لهونيك كان معي 200 فرنك بجيبتي. 200 فرنك وبلشت هونيك اشتغل بالترافو يعني نظف البنايات من برا وعشية كان شغل الثاني هو نظف الصحون ما رحت على المدرسه بس تعلمت كل شيء بالكتاب كتاب اكل كتاب لغه لانه لنتقدم ببلد لازم نعرف اللغه واللغه كثير ضروريه وبلشت اكبر اشتريت اول مطعم ب 2007 بس ما اشتهرت فيه لانه الاكل بده وقت كثير لنفهمه كيف الطعمات التكستور وكيف بنخلط ودليتني اشتغل بباريس واتعلم وضلني على طول طموحي انه اكون انا انشهر وانعرف باكلي. دليتني اشتغل 18 سنه اقل اقل ساعه بنهار 15 ساعه، كل يوم اشتغل، ويك اند فات كل شيء. بال 2018 فتحت مطعم وسلم سميته الان جام وبقلبه هذا المطعم حبيت حط اكل فرنسي والتكنيك الاكل الفرنسي تعلمت فيه، بس كنت حابب كمان حط شيء لبناني النكهه اللبنانيه بس هو شكر لوالدتي اللي هي الاول شيف تبعيتي واللي حب يعني خلتني احب اكون شيف واطبخ للعالم ولما صرت انا اعمل هذا الاكل الموجود هلا هو هو مثل الميزه اللبنانيه بس ما مبين شيء ميزه بس هذا كله فلافل وحمص ولبني وكل شيء وهيدي مثل البقلاوه بس مغيره عرفت كيف؟ بس صرت صرت انا احس كثير بالاموسيون بالايموشن بشغلي صار لما اطبخ عيوني بتدمع ويوم من الايام الزبون اجى لعندي اكل اخر شيء بيطلع لي بطاطا وبيقول لي انا من المفتشين الميشلان، الميشلان هو كتاب من اهم كتب بنقوا اهم مطاعم وشيفيه بالعالم. قال لي انت شو عامل باكلك؟ قلت له انا الاكل الاكل الفرنسي بحبه هو موجود بفرنسا من 20 سنه مشان الاكل، بس بقلبه حاطط اشياء لبنانيه بس لشكر لوالدتي هي اللي علمتني حب الاكل. بعدين ما في خبر منهم الا ل 4 شباط 2018 اجيني تليفون على الساعه 6 وربع عم بيقولوا لي الشيف الان تفضل على السيرموني بخمس شباط انت حتكون من اول شيفيه لبنانيه عند النجمه بلقيد مشلا هلا هي طبعا ما بهالسهوله لانه ما معي وقت كثير لاشرح لكم كل شيء عم شوف السماعه ضيقه هي اخذت شغل كثير اخذت الشغل 20 سنه بس انا من 2018 اشتهرت كثير قبل ما اشتري بلبنان ما اشتريت بفرنسا واجى يعني الاجونس فرونسيز دو بريس بعثوا حطوا بكل المجلات بالعالم كلها قصتي سموني انه اجى من من المهاجرين من الحرب الاهليه اللبنانيه للنجوم بباريس 
وانا كثير صرت حالاتي مع لبنان رجعت انتعشت بالزعتر والزيت ودبس الرمان وهلا حسست كثير بالمسؤوليه لانه اليوم من عم بيحكوا كثير على لبنان وكل يوم بحكي على لبنان باكله كل يوم الناس بتقول انت شيف لبناني بعدين بيقولوا لي ميشلان بعدين بيقولوا لي فرنسي أه هو اهم شيء اللي حاولت انا ما اخسر اللغه تبعي لقيت محافظ عليها ولبنانيتي موجوده لو مش مستكن هون بس كل يوم فكر بلبنان كل يوم فكر باهلي وعلى طول اليوم معهم على طول واللي حبوا بالمستقبل اكبر كثير وبس كمان فرجي الاكل اللبناني انه فينا نعمل فيه اختراعات هي جدا 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 وحابب كبروا يكون عندي نجمه ونجمتين وثلاثه وحابب بس كمان للشباب اعطيهم امل انه اوكي ما في عندنا بول بوكيس هون او لان دوكاس بس عندنا امهاتنا هن من احلى الشفيات بالعالم وهذا الاكل اللبناني من اطيب اكل بالعالم بدي اعطيهم ثقه بنفسهم انكم فيكم توصلوا بس فيها تعب فيها شغل فيها ما من اول اشاك بالحياه لازم ننزل ايدينا ونقول اه ماما مش الحال وما في مش بالبلد ما فيها مستقبل ولا شيء فينا نوصل وين ما كان بس هي بدها مشهود بدها شغل بدنا نحط اهداف واحلام ونحققهم ونسعى لهم لهالشيء وانا بتشكركم كثير من امبارحه يعني حابكي لانه كل الناس عم بيقولوا لي انت فخر لانه فخر لانه ما متصورت ابدا انه من 20 سنه رحنا بالطريق وكون من اول شايف لبناني عنده نجمه مش بتشكركم على الاكل تبعيتكم وبتشكر الال دو او وبتشكر الناس اللي فكروا يجيبونا يرجعونا على لبنان لانه نحن حياتنا كلها هونيك بتشكرهم على الناس اللي قالوا اوكي في ناس 20 مليون مغترب لبناني كلها يعني قالنا غصه انه مش سكني بلبنان ولبنان بيدلوا من احلى بلد بالعالم You're amazing. It doesn't matter. It's nice to have a choice of languages. He was trying to decide, do I speak French, do I speak Arabic, do I speak Lebanese? I don't have those choices in my life. You're amazing. Thank you, Alan. Thank you so, so much. Our next speaker. Please, ladies and gentlemen, will you welcome up... Um, I'm not. I'm in the wrong direction. She's there. I was just sitting next to you. Mrs. Betty Milan. She is... Fantastic. She's an author. She has written many novels, chronicles, essays, and plays, and she is a psychoanalyst as well. So please welcome her onto the podium. Thank you. Hi. <laughs> well, je vais parler en français. Bravo parce que c'est la deuxième langue du Liban. J'aurais souhaité parler en arabe, mais je suis la troisième génération et la langue ne m'a pas été transmise. Alors, je remercie d'abord le consul du Liban à San Polo, M. Roudi Al-Azi, et ceux qui me reçoivent au Liban si gentiment. Avant toute chose... Je voudrais vous dire que je suis très émue d'être ici parce que je suis née au Brésil, mais mes grands-parents sont libanais. Sans l'immigration, peut-être n'aurais-je pas connu l'existence. D'autre part, je suis émue parce que j'ai l'espoir que ces conférences internationales de la diaspora aideront le Liban à devenir ce qu'il a été, un lieu de côtoiement permanent et intime entre des populations de différents cultes, un lieu de profonde convivialité. En général, quand on parle d'immigration, on pense au fait qui la détermine et aux difficultés objectives d'immigrer. Ce qui m'intéresse dans ma littérature et qu'on retrouve dans mes textes, ce sont les conséquences de l'immigration sur les individus. Pour écrire, j'ai écouté les voix de la vie, de la joie et de la souffrance de ceux qui ont dû laisser leur pays natal. Dans mes romans sur la diaspora, il s'agit donc de l'histoire affective des immigrants et de leurs descendants. Une histoire qui, pour différentes raisons, tend à rester cachée. Parmi ces raisons, il y a l'intolérance à laquelle les immigrants et leurs descendants sont continuellement exposés. 
qu'il me soit permis de rappeler que le mot xénophobie vient du grec xénos qui signifie étranger et phobos qui signifie crainte. Le mot xénophobie désigne la peur de l'étranger, l'aversion à son égard. Je l'ai vécu dans ma peau pour être descendante d'immigrants libanais qui sont partis pour le Brésil à la fin du XIXe siècle afin de ne pas servir l'armée turque ou autrement dit pour échapper à une guerre qui n'était pas la leur. Comme d'ailleurs les guerres d'aujourd'hui. Il y a 25 ans, j'ai écrit un roman inspiré de mon analyse avec Lacan, ainsi que de la traversée de mes ancêtres. Un des thèmes de l'œuvre est la xénophobie, celle des Brésiliens envers les Libanais, celle des Libanais envers les Brésiliens et celle de l'héroïne vis-à-vis d'elle-même. Ce roman est une métaphore de l'immigration. Il s'est fait au Brésil, mais il aurait pu se passer n'importe où. Et l'écriture du livre n'a été possible que parce que j'avais fait une analyse. Grâce à l'analyse, j'ai pu m'observer moi-même et révéler à travers le texte les différentes formes de xénophobie à l'origine d'une crise d'identité qui peut imploser le monde et sur laquelle nous tous, nous tous sommes au courant. D'emblée dans mon roman, la xénophobie est liée aux natifs. Les premiers Libanais qui arrivèrent au Brésil avaient quitté leur pays pour échapper aux Turcs. Et paradoxalement, sous les tropiques, on les traitait de Turcs ou de mangeurs d'hommes. Toutefois, il faut préciser que si le natif du pays de l'immigration est xénophobe vis-à-vis -vis de l'immigrant, celui-ci peut l'être aussi vis-à-vis -vis du natif. La xénophobie de l'immigrant dans sa relation avec le natif a des sérieuses conséquences pour sa descendance, qui reste partagée entre ses ancêtres et ses contemporains, une situation Impossible à tenir. En dehors de ces deux formes de xénophobie, il y a une troisième qui est très grave. C'est l'autoxénophobie, ou comme dit Amin Malouf, que je viens d'interviewer, euh, la haine de soi. Cette haine de soi peut faire Oublier les origines. Le descendant de l'immigrant dans cette situation tend à dissimuler son histoire. Il ne veut pas être le fils ou le petit-fils de celui qui a dû s'arracher au pays natal et s'est senti humilié dans son pays d'arrivée. L'immigration est une blessure narcissique qui peut se transmettre d'une génération à l'autre. Et l'histoire du descendant de l'immigrant dépend de la relation de chaque immigrant avec son passé. La guerre est peut-être inévitable, l'immigration aussi, mais l'oubli peut être évité. Le mémoricide, un crime aussi grave que l'homicide, le mémoricide est le thème de mon nouveau roman sur l'immigration dont le titre est Bal. Bal est une histoire de famille. Elle invite le lecteur à se pencher sur son passé pour mieux comprendre le présent. Bal évoque le drame actuel de l'immigration, relatant la vie sur la terre natale et la renaissance dans un nouveau pays avec une autre langue et une autre culture. C'est aussi un roman sur l'intelligence de l'immigrant, et particulièrement des immigrants libanais, 
qui ont parcouru le Brésil du nord au sud et introduit le commerce grâce à leur tradition. Le héros, patron et inspirateur d'Omar, c'est Simbad le marin. Omar dit à son propos, Simbad pouvait s'en sortir, je vais finir, Simbad pouvait s'en sortir parce qu'il était observateur, toujours capable d'improviser, de trouver une issue. Les paroles d'Omar évoquent celles de Martin Luther King. « Make a way out of no way ». C'est bien ce que fait l'immigrant. Par-dessus tout, du jour au lendemain, ce qui lui reste, c'est sa vie. Il prend en main son propre salut. C'est ce que nous avons à faire face aux tragédies d'aujourd'hui. Nous avons à prendre notre salut en main, comme l'a fait Omar, que l'histoire de mon grand-père a inspiré. Vous pouvez comprendre mon émotion quand avant-hier, avec quelques cousins, je suis revenue dans le village du Mont-Liban, d'où mon grand-père est parti à jamais, il y a 120 ans. Merci, Choukra. Betty, thank you very, very much. Thank you. And well done. All right, our next speaker I'm going to welcome up onto our stage, His Excellency, former Minister of Health in Mexico City, Dr. Jose Armando Awed Ortega. Thank you. Thank you so much. And just a reminder to our speakers, could we please just ensure that we stick to the time limit? Our, uh, our clocks are on the side there. You'll be able to see your timing. I think it's on. Oh, Muy bien. Buenos, buenas tardes a todas y a todos. Los saludo con mucho afecto. Eh, agra Voy a hablar en español. Ah, qué bien. <ríe> bueno, primero estoy muy orgulloso, muy contento de participar en este gran evento. Hola, hola. Ah. Saludo con mucho afecto. A la ministra de Energía de Líbano. I'm very pleased to, to be here and thanks for the Minister of Energy to be here. And I give him a, a big applause. Todos ustedes los saludo con mucho afecto de diferentes países que hoy convivimos en este gran evento. To all of you that we share in this big event and important and thank you for, for being here as well. Bueno, quiero saludar a mi familia. Saludo a toda la comunidad libanesa que es mi familia y que hoy está. To the Mexican delegation that is one of the biggest here and uh, it's my family as well. Bueno, y decirles que estoy muy contento por bienvenido, señor ministro. Okay. Welcome, uh, Mr. Gebran Besil, and thank you for being in this uh, with us. Bueno, muy contento por varias razones. La primera, porque es la primera vez que vengo a Líbano y que mi familia es de un lugar que se llama el Midén, Yesin, y me siento muy orgulloso de tener sangre libanesa. I'm uh, very happy to be here in Lebanon. It's the first time that uh, I visit this country. And my grandfather was from uh, Miden Jesin, and I'm so happy to be in Lebanon, my country. En segundo lugar, por participar en este gran evento, en, este, en esta fuerza de la diáspora. Uh, to participate at the LDE in the diaspora. Y en tercer lugar, porque tuve la responsabilidad, la honrosa responsabilidad de manejar la salud de una de las ciudades más grandes del mundo, la Ciudad de México, durante 11 años fue ministro de salud y enfrenté momentos muy complicados. I had the bless and the opportunity to be the Secretary of Health of Mexico City and to take charge of 25 million people and uh, take care of them. Y viví momentos muy complicados, como en 2009 me tocó cerrar la Ciudad de México por la influenza, por el flu, eh, la H1N1. I had uh, very difficult times and crisis 
I, uh, I had the big decision to close Mexico City uh, in the 2009 because the swine flu, H1N1. Varios sismos en la Ciudad de México. We had uh, earthquakes. En and, uh, 2017, donde tuvimos un sismo muy grande después de más de 30 años que tuvimos un mega sismo en la Ciudad de México. I had the responsibility to take care of the people the, in the last earthquake in last year. It was 7.5 uh, Richter and we had some dead people and I was taking care of the health of the society. Haber sido el médico de la Ciudad de México y tener la responsabilidad de cuidar la salud y la vida de tantos habitantes, pues fue una gran oportunidad en mi vida profesional, pero también humana. I was the doctor of the Mexico City and uh, was a great responsibility to take care of the health of the people. Y también ante la nueva perspectiva de la salud en el mundo, en donde pasamos dos transiciones, la demográfica y la epidemiológica. Hoy la gente vive 80, 90 y 100 años. Hace 60 años la gente vivía 50. Now we are facing a new change of the health in the world. People before were expecting to live 40 years. Now we have people that live over 100 years. Y hoy con mucho orgullo Hoy Microphone please. Hoy comparto con ustedes un programa que está Microphone, please. Bueno, parto con... Está fallando, bueno. Les decía que hoy comparto un video de un programa que hice en la Ciudad de México okay. que se llama Médico en tu Casa. Y okay. que este programa eh, es una manera diferente de atender a las personas, sobre todo las personas que no pueden acudir a una unidad médica. Ok. Uh, he, he create a doctor in your house that is a program that put the health in the system of Mexico. Hoy se replica en 16 países en el mundo y hoy orgullosamente lo traigo al Líbano y entrego al señor ministro el programa que hice I'm para Líbano the... para que si así lo desean lo repliquen en Líbano. Muchas gracias, Shukran. Thank you very much, Doctor. All right, now, let's quickly move on to our next speaker. I'll just switch on my microphone. Our next speaker here with us is uh, from the International Lebanese Medical Association, Professor Tufik Seman. Professor? Ah, there you are. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. LDE conference. My talk is about the health bridge between Lebanon and the world. And really, it is a health bridge in this sense. It's a great honor and a pleasure to meet you in our homeland, Lebanon. I'd like, on behalf of our association, to the organizers of this big event, by our invitation to include our presentation. Let me start my talk by telling you that the, internet, that the International Lebanese Medical Association is so important to Lebanese health professionals worldwide, and certainly it is a bridge between Lebanon and the world. It is in the sense repeated, it is, it is the healthy bridge that we can do. Our international association was established in 2013 by colleagues from four different countries, Australia, Belgium, 
Brazil and the United States. It is a non-political, non-denominational association and currently comprises health professionals of Lebanese heritage worldwide. Currently, we are present in more than 12 countries expanding in Africa, Europe, North, Central, and South America. I am proud to say that we launched IUMA in 2015 in Beirut at Beit al-Tabib in the presence of our Lebanese Minister of Foreign Affairs, Your Honor Gibran Basile, who endorsed our association. And what are the goals of IUMA? Firstly, providing a forum for professional, educational, research, and social exchange and project among its members internationally and within Lebanon. We want to have meaningful medical scientific conferences which brings together and showcases health professionals not only from Lebanon but also worldwide. This will provide a forum whereby we can bring together and showcase the rich talent Lebanese heritage have in the areas of medicine and medical research within Lebanon and throughout the world. Secondly, fostering linkage between the medical and health profession in Lebanon and worldwide. We have many talent and esteemed health professionals of Lebanese heritage throughout the world and we can galvanize these talent individual in their specialty to assist the health professional Lebanon in areas that they seek assistance. To promote the exchange and education of medical practitioners and members of the health profession is an important goal of EUMA. It is the main one. Thirdly, providing advice and guidance on medical and health issue to any organization, association, institution, or government body where it affects the Lebanese population, particularly important, we can all learn from our experience in different parts of the world and here in Lebanon. We are providing scholarship to the medical student from all medical schools. The selection is based on merit and financial needs. We are also assisting medical students who wish to continue their medical education abroad and get involved in innovation research projects. The majority of these students suit their training and residency and fellowship programs in different specialty and in different country. We have done humanitarian health fair, mobile clinic, to serve and privileged people in several areas in Lebanon. I want to stress that EUMA wants to partner the Lebanese health professional in any facets of the, of the health system that's relevant to them. We are not here to dictate, we are here to learn, and mainly we are here to help. Okay, okay. Thank you, Professor. Apologies, we are running very, very, very tight right now. I want to bring up our next speaker now. Um, he, of course, is an MIT graduate. He is the CEO of Dirk and co-founder, and they work between the UAE and the United States. Uh, please welcome Dr. Georges Aude. Thank you. Check out the time just so that you know your timing. Perfect. Thank you. So this is a picture of a shuttle being launched in Florida. I was there, I was invited because one of my satellites was on the shuttle and NASA astronauts were sent to actually test it in the International Space Station. This is May 2008. He's got three minutes. Next slide. This is more recent. This is two months ago. Uh, I was receiving uh, the award of best AI startup in South by Southwest and for my uh, startup Dirk uh, in Austin, uh, Texas. These are from my career, and I'm very proud and honored to be here to tell you my story. I was born in Enfid, a beautiful town in the north of Lebanon. 
I studied in College San Josef Antura. And next slide. And early on, I loved, um, I loved math. And this led me to go and study at McGill computer engineering. And I excelled. Next slide, please. I excelled academically there. Uh, everything was great about McGill, except it was very cold, as you can see, most of the year. Um, and I set a myself that after McGill, I want to go to the top school, top uh, engineering school in the world, obviously MIT. I was uh, very fortunate to be accepted there, and since arriving, I was involved in some of the most cutting-edge um, research. Next slide, please. And you can see here, these are my satellites, and they are floating because they are in the International Space Station. This is one of the NASA astronauts watching them. I had the opportunity to have a number of video conferences uh, like this one here with NASA astronauts. And in fact, uh, I, I thought it was a really cool ex ex experience. And I even took my um, girlfriend at the time, my wife, Karin, who's with us today, as a first date to watch one of these video conferences. Probably not the most romantic, but I thought it was one of the coolest uh, first dates ever. Um, continue. And, and soon enough, after my, PhD, uh, my master, I went to my PhD, and I was working with the US DOT to solve a big problem, which is how can you predict accidents before they happen? And this is around 2009. This is early days of machine learning. I was able to develop algorithms to predict and prevent 9 of 10 accidents. So predicting accidents ahead of time. We were able to be featured in um, MIT and News and uh, New York Times and receive patent um, and that was ac accepted globally. I wasn't ready to launch uh, my company at the time. The market wasn't ready, so I worked in industry. But soon after, I, I launched Dirk, convinced two co-founders, uh, my great co-founders here, Carl and Amr. Next slide, please. And uh, the, convinced them to solve the big problem of 1.3 million people dying yearly on the roads. This number, unfortunately, are getting worse. Next slide, please. And this is when we launched Dirk. Very, in, in two years of our existence, we are very fortunate to win a number of awards, open office in Dubai, in Detroit. And uh, we won't have time to show you the video here uh, unless we can click. It's a few seconds one. Before they even cross, talk to the car in real time, accident from happening. Imagine the system running now. It's in Dubai, in Detroit, in Ohio. Hopefully, one day it will be in, in Beirut. And this is one slide back. So, and, and here, the system has proven we're working with the biggest companies of the world, Qualcomm, Siemens, and others. And we're live, as I mentioned, in Dubai. Next slide, please. In Dubai and Detroit, and recently in Ohio. And we're expanding. We're looking for talent. So if you're a software engineer, a data scientist, if you're an investor, you know who to talk to. Finally, I just want to say one last word. This cannot, be, cannot happen without a big support system, strong support system. My parents, my sisters who believed in me from the beginning, and my wife, Karin, who's with us today, who is my biggest inspiration and supporter. Thank you. Thank you. Our last speaker for today. His name is Dr. Habib Shamoun. He's a professor of negotiation. He's also a Phoenician culture promoter. So you really are going to want to hear this. So please, everybody, take your seats so that we can give Dr. Habib Shamoun the platform to wrap up today's LDE Talks. Give him a round of applause. He is here. He is in the country. He has flown in specifically for this moment. And we are honored to have him here. So if you could all, whoever is in the room, please just take a seat and let us just have five more minutes of your time. Thank you very, very much. Dr. Shamoun, if you would come up. Hello, everybody. Being Lebanese is a beautiful privilege. I always been very proud of the Lebanese culture. In fact, a lot of the people that I know, the Lebanese that I know, they brag about being Lebanese, and that's one of the few cultures that I know they do that. And I've been studying this, and I believe that the cedar, the Lebanese roots, are so deeply into our souls that everybody, everywhere we go, it shows up. I'm blessed to be Lebanese. Ever since my childhood, I know where I'm coming from. I'm, I always been fond of the ancient civilizations, where all my life work, 
I have been, without knowing, studying the Phoenician identity, even if I didn't know that. Can you change the slide, please? And that's everything since my childhood, it took me to where I am today, that passion about the Phoenicians, which I think they are a long gone, but I hope we still have some Phoenicians in you. Now, if we look at the next one, that's my work, and I've been in search of a Phoenician identity without knowing, and you can look in there in my findings in the next one, the characteristics of the Phoenicians or of the Lebanese culture is a strong capacity of negotiating, beautiful networking skills, communication skills, but also something very important that some of the women mentioned this morning, the resilience, great resilience. If you look at the next slide, uh, if I picture the Lebanese woman today, it's very well portrayed in the story of the Princess Dido, or Elisa, where she, not, she will never trade her dignity for her work. And also, her resilience and intelligence is well known everywhere in history. You cannot disagree with me that the Phoenician ladies today, or the Lebanese, you know, they still resemble that. Very strong resilience, they won't corrupt themselves, and they will look at family and business together with all these values. If you look at that picture, the ancestors, the, the ancients, the historians, they talk about every man has within himself their ancestors. I'm so happy to tell you that I'm coming from a very proud Lebanese family, and they went to Mexico, and my parents and my grandparents, they were so great at, at respecting and honoring their world and using the culture of respect, dignity, dignity tolerance, that I was there a few weeks ago, and my family, the mayor of the city where they immigrated to, he unveiled a plaque honoring the legacy of my family in the small town of Rosita in Mexico. To me, that's my story. That's what transcendence means all about. If you look, for me, being successful, if you look at the next one, is having a great family, and especially having a great Lebanese wife, intelligence like Dido as well, and beautiful, and my kids as well. And also, knowing your talents and using your talents, teaching others about your talents. In short, having your talents, knowing your talents, and teaching others all over, plus bringing all this spirit of abundance is what it's all about, to respect and honor your heritage. If you look, I was in a monastery teaching in Austria, in the woods of Austria, a Cistercian monastery, and there I found a very profound silence which I never experienced before. And I got connected to the deepest level of myself. And there I connected to the greatness of the ancients, to myself, to my spirit, and it was like I was with a superior being there. And then I connected to my ancestor, and I found that the key of transcendence is really to honor your past and your heritage. Then, after being there, can you go to the next one? The previous one, the Caesar, if we actually honor our past in the present, we become as strong as a Caesar, and you transcend generations, and nothing will, uh, will get you go. Then, for me, if you look at that, what are we going to do with the next generations? That's my question. The centennials, the millennials. How are we going to connect it to our past? How are they going to be as passionate as we are? You can see my daughter, when she was a very small kid, she was teaching the Americans about the Phoenicians. Okay? So th we need to teach the new generations. And I would like to end with a quote of uh, Pope Francis. He recently said that the roots give you the fruits of the future. And those fruits of the future are the ones that become your roots. And he mentioned to the youth, and I mentioned to the youth as well, how are we going to do so that our roots become your seeds, and your seeds become the roots of our legacy? That's the question. Remember who you are, the sons and the daughters of the cedars. Thank you. Euh, si vous permettez, le livre...
euh, négocier comme un phénicien. C'est un excellent livre. C'est dommage que le public qui était là tout à l'heure est parti, mais c'est un livre qui donne les fondamentaux d'une négociation réussie. Cher euh, Ch Monsieur Chamaoun, euh, tu as été brillant dans l'écriture de ces livres dans trois langues, et j'espère que tout Libanais digne de ces noms euh, euh, partira ou euh, comment dirais-je, il, il, il court dans une librairie la plus proche pour euh, procurer ses livres parce qu'il est très intéressant. Merci, Merci. d'avoir accepté de donner rapidement ces résumés parce que ça valait la peine quand même que tous les publics écoutent euh, ce que tu viens de dire. Merci, Merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup. Lovely. Thank you very, very much.